It's always taken a moral movement to change America. People of all races and creeds and colors and religions and ages and genders and sexualities. People are committing to building a moral fusion movement and building power. Everybody say, oh! This movement is not about merely saving the Democratic Party or criticizing the Republican Party. This movement is about saving the soul of this nation. We are rising up to fight poverty, not the poor. registering, educating people for the movement who vote. I cannot stand here and claim to be a follower of Jesus Christ and be silent about the moral outrage that is going on in our country. We have a moral crisis in this country. Any nation that ignores half of its people is in a moral and economic crisis. Forward together, not one step back. There will be a movement that will break through the calm and bring people together to save the heart and the soul of this democracy and this world. Good evening, my name is Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris. I'm the director of the Cairo Center for Religions, Rights and Social Justice at Union Theological Seminary and the co-chair with the Reverend Dr. William Barber II of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. And thank you for joining us this afternoon. If there ever was a time to fight, it is now, 200,000 dead from the novel coronavirus in a nation that spends more money on healthcare than any other. A president willingly assassinating democracy, calling for massive voter suppression, vowing to appoint judges so that he remains in power, emboldening white nationalists. A Senate, that has refused to pass a stimulus, provide any relief to the unemployed, uninsured, those facing evictions, but is quickly convening to stack the court even before the nation mourns the loss of Ruth Bader Ginsburg. An injustice department that has no accountability to the people or to the constitution of the nation in plain view in the statement that came down in the Breonna Taylor case yesterday, we all saw that we're living in a moment when property is valued, not people. The only charge any officer who murdered an innocent black woman asleep in her own home got was for shooting into another house, not for taking the life of this child of God. The wealthy and powerful suppressing wages of essential workers so that billionaires can accumulate more than $875 billion at the same time that the poorest families are losing absolutely everything. And some of the worst wildfires and hurricanes and tornadoes and climate disasters in history literally have the world on fire. While the fossil fuel industry and corporations have more influence on our national politics than the people. This is what the Bible calls a Kairos moment. A time of great crisis, the crumbling of all our institutions, the breaking down of society. 
plagues shed light on foundations of injustice. Prophetic leaders preach judgment and doom while oppressors double down on misery. But Kairos is also about the possibility for change, the birth and growth of movements for justice, opportunity for a revolution of values, a radical redistribution of political and economic power. And do we ever need such a radical redistribution? There are 140 million who are poor or one fire, one healthcare crisis, one job loss, one storm away from deep poverty. There are 1,000 people killed by the police, those who protect, to, who vow to protect and serve every year. There are 64 million workers now being called essential, but still being paid expendable wages. And over the past months, misery and dispossession are growing. More than 12 million people have lost their employer-based health care, adding to the 80 million who had inadequate health care in the first place. There is record job loss. More than 30 million people claimed unemployment benefits in August. Tens of millions facing evictions. 13 million reported to not have enough to eat. In a nation that throws away more food than it takes to feed the whole world. And last month, one in 10 people reported being depressed, suicidal, because the injustice is just too much. It's too hard. Millions of teachers and students struggling to go to school with less resources and no infrastructure for learning while our political leaders are willing to sacrifice children's lives to the altar of greed and profit. Again, this is in a nation that spends hundreds of billions of dollars on the military. This is a nation that bails out banks and corporations to the tune of trillions of dollars overnight. And perhaps people saw this week, Mike Pompeo attempted to create a commission on unalienable rights at the United Nations around religious liberty, around private property. Those are not unalienable rights. Unalienable rights are the right to life, including health care and living wages, They're the right to liberty, including freedom from state violence and debt forgiveness. They're the, they're the pursuit of happiness, including quality, education, paid, sick leave. The only way we can achieve these rights is if we shift the narrative, if we build power. The only way we can save this democracy is if we unite and we fight. The only way we can promote justice is if a, mo a movement of those locked up and left out, undocumented immigrants, indigenous nations, uninsured fathers, homeless mothers, come together and mobilize and organize and register and educate people for a movement that votes. If ever there was a time to fight, it is now. It is now. History tells us that Ida B. Wells used to go to lynching mobs of thousands with just seven or eight people with her. Today, many folks will say, well, I would have stood up for, against lynching. But the question is, now, when justice is being lynched in our nation, will you stand up? If we were to actually calculate all the people that say that they were a part of civil rights marches, anti-war marches, it would be millions and millions more than who actually showed up at some of those events. But the question is now, will you show up? Will you join your voice for justice? It's gonna take a movement of millions to shift this moment. I wanna conclude with my favorite quote from the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He said, the poor and dispossessed of this nation live in a cruelly unjust society. They must organize a revolution, not against their fellow citizens, but against the structures that are at hand and have been called for to lift the load of poverty and injustice. 
There are millions of people in this nation who have little or even nothing to lose. If they can be helped to take action together, they will be a new and unsettling force in our complacent national life. There is a new and unsettling force rising up in this country. We are at democracy's deathbed. We are united to build a better world. If ever there was a time to suit up in the fight for justice, it is now. History depends on it. Thank you. Indeed, Reverend Dr. Liz, that is the truth. And I want persons who are listening to see on the bottom of the screen how you can take action. I'm Reverend Dr. William J. Barber, and I have the privilege of serving with Reverend Dr. Liz Theo Harris as the co-chair of the Poor People's Campaign and to serve with so many, many thousands and thousands of you who represent what the Bible calls the remnant. And there's always a remnant of people in the midst of great despair, a remnant of people who hold on to what is right that end up changing and pushing the nation forward. In the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, there is a scripture I'd like to paraphrase, and it basically says, we are in the time when there will be and there is a shaking. There have been shakings before, but there is a shaking. And this shaking will expose everything because everything that can be shaken will be shaken until only that that cannot be shaken will remain. What do you do in a time of shaking like this? Existential shaking. Kairos, as Liz said, shaking. I want to share with you some teas, if you will, uh, that I think we ought to hold on to in this moment. First, you stay with the truth. The interlocking injustices we've been naming the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, are the truth. Racism, we have to face it together with systemic poverty, with together with ecological devastation, together with the war economy, and together with the false moral narrative of religious nationalism and white evangelicalism. Even before this moment, we declared and we said these are the interlocking injustices that were cutting at the very heart of our democracy. Uh, that were attempting to stop the very heart of our democracy, and that we were being called to be the moral defibrillators of our time and to shock the heart of this nation with those things that, that are the antithesis to those truths, those ugly realities. It is the truth, and we must stay with this, that it is, yes, this season when we have a particular person in the White House named Trump and his allies, but it's not just Trump alone. It's so much more. We've known that. It is the way in which persons align themselves to keep these interlocking truths to, uh, together and Im to impact negatively on the lives of people throughout these United States. We must face, not separately, not as one group of people over here and another group of people over there, but we must face systemic racism, systemic poverty, ecological devastation, the war economy, and the false moral narrative of religious nationalism. And every statistic that Liz just gave to you, every point she just made about what's happening in our courts and what's happening in the attempt to hijack the Supreme Court, what happened in the case of uh, Breonna Taylor and the ki her killers and on and on and on, the numbers she gave you are all wrapped up in these interlocking in injustices. A uh, King once called it triune evils, and we call them interlocking injustices. So we have to stay with the truth. You can't get anywhere without telling the truth. In fact, in a time of deceit, truth, truth itself is revolutionary. 
But not only must we stay with the truth about what ails us as a nation and what must be challenged and changed, we must stop being surprised. We must stop being surprised uh, when we know the truth. We are seeing what we call necropolitics, the politics of death, the politics of death of some for the greed, the racism, and the lust of power for others. That's a truth that we have to recognize. And it's always been this way. Racism, classism, poverty, oppression, false religious narratives have always had within them a death measurement on the on the down low, I like to say, always. And which is why we must understand that in this moment of necropolitics, the politics of death, in this shaking, we are seeing what greed and racism and lust of power unchecked will do to a nation, will do to a people. The second thing we have to recognize is we must see that this period of tribulation is also a period of transformation. In fact, tribulation and transformation are happening at the same time. In this tribulation, in this very tribulation, when we see all of the things that Reverend Liz just mentioned, and all of them happening simultaneously, there is also the possibility for the nation to hear what we should have heard years ago. We're learning now that systemic racism and systemic poverty in the midst of COVID, we're learning that they are matters of national security. We're learning that in the midst of those fissures is what gives something like COVID so much power. We're learning that if we had dealt with some things before, we would not need to have so much problem in the midst of what we're facing now. We're learning, we're learning in this period of tribulation that police brutality is not just a recent reality. It was even mentioned in the speech of Dr. King on the March on Washington when he connected that to the struggle for freedom and the struggle for economics. We are learning in this tribulation how ugly these matters are, but also perhaps in this tribulation in this tribulation, there is transformation. And transform, one of the trans, great transformations we may be seeing is in the midst of all of this pain. People are retaining some sense of humanity. People are beginning to understand a remnant, a strong and powerful remnant, that we are all really inextricably bound together, as Dr. King once said. We are learning that we, have, we did not hear things as a nation, we should have heard long ago, but we're getting another chance in the midst of these tribulations. Remember years ago, if you will, what we were told? Let me share with you an extensive quote that, 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 we, that we were told as a nation some time ago. Over 40 years ago, 50 years ago, we were told we must develop a federal program of public works, retaining and jobs, for all so that none, white or black, will have At the present time, thousands we are disappearing, disappearing in the wake of automation and other production efficiency techniques. Black and whites will all be harmed unless something grand and imaginative is done. A stricken white man must realize that he is there as people. That's Dr. King 50 years ago. Look again, he just together. Again, black and white and others, they massive pressure on the government to get to all together from a grand alliance to stand together. They could merge for goodwill. So I want you all to know today that a touchy feely slogan is not some easy kind of coming together. This is Dr. King 50 years ago. Listen again. Dr. King said in 1957, speaking to a group just like this, that, that um, it's on this line. He said it might be that the only group who could form the massive restructure of American society would be for blacks, poor whites, progressive whites, working class folks, and even the recipients of welfare, along with Latinos and 
and, and, and indigenous people. This may be the only coalition that can shift the America's economic architecture and make the profound changes necessary to care for all her people. Dr. King was telling us then that we're all in the same boats. We may have come over here in different boats, but now we're all in the same boat socially and politically. And that is something that we're learning in the midst of this hard tribulation. That, that, and that maybe there's a transformation even in the midst of this pain, a transformation of people being reminded that we're in the same boat. We're in the same storm in the same boat now. And there are things that we must do when we have and recognize. He also said something back then we have to hear. He said 50 year, nearly 50 years ago, we need a stimulus plan. Mm -hmm. We need a stimulus plan. This is 1967, my brothers and sisters. We need a stimulus plan. A stimulus plan that would have a bottom up approach, not a banker down approach. What if we had listened then? We would not be in the trouble that we're in now. We've now learned that Wall Street can't drive a just society. Capitalism can't be driven crazy by greed over and over again and continue to operate from a perspective of plantation capitalism. If you ignore the poor, if you ignore those on the bottom, there will eventually be an implosion. There will be an implosion. In fact, we've been talking about this whole economic crisis sometimes the wrong way. The matter of the, 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 the fact of the matter is people didn't just start dying this year from COVID. Before COVID, 700 people were dying a day from poverty and low wealth. Before COVID, if, if for every 1 million people without health care, thousands were dying. Before COVID, over 143 million people, 43 million people were living in a silent depression, a silent depression. And now in the midst of COVID, it's all caught up with us. There was a political economist some years ago from the University of Maryland that wrote a piece, and, and he said it was entitled America Beyond Capitalism, and this is what he said. He said, what we are really beginning to experience is a process of slow decay, punctuated by a recurring economic crisis, one in which reforms achieve sporadic gains, but the long-term trends of growing inequality, economic dislocation, racial violence, failing democratic accountability, deepening poverty, ecological degradation, greater invasions of liberty, and growing imprisonment, uh, especially of minorities and police mistreatment, continue to slowly and quietly challenge the beliefs in the capacities and moral integrity of the overall system and its governing elites. This is not an article written just this year. This is an article written years ago. And we did not, and, did, and the society as a whole did not hear this wisdom. But maybe now in the midst of this tribulation, as hard as it is, over and over, the Bible teaches that there come moments, there come, there come these moments where everything that can be shaken will be shaken, so that only that that cannot be shaken will remain. Some time ago, Professor Otto Swama at MIT said, there is a blind spot in, in the American economic theory today it is called consciousness. Our refusal to have an economic theory, a society theory that looks and sees that we are all integrated and we really do need each other. And not only is this moment a moment we must stay with the truth, not only must we see in the midst of these that, that we have tribulation and transformation happening at the same time. This is a moment of trickery. Trickery that we have to really call out the Federalist Society, for instance, has used Roe versus Wade as trickery, as trickery for years to plant plot a movement for a corporate takeover of the courts and uh, uh, from, the, from the bottom to the top. The Federalist Society that grew out of the religion of racism and corporate greed, that grew out of those that fought against desegregation, and who've always wanted to take over the power, the economic power of this country. They have combined and they're using this trickery. And the trickery says, let's see if we can't rob two seats uh, in the Supreme Court and the American public will just sit back and take it. 
trickery, trickery. Let's see, can't we turn legitimate critique of police brutality into a focus on law and order and then undermine the law to make protest illegal? Let's see if we can't make protesters of police brutality enemies of the state. Let's see if we can make telling the truth about black history and the history of racism in this country false history. But my friends, it's not new. It's as old as the mythologies that produce genocide of Indian people and, sla- and the slavery of black people and the hatred towards Chinese people and the blaming of the swine flu pandemic 100 years ago on the Spanish people. That's why. And the call calling nonviolent civil rights protesters and anti-war protesters, mobs and thugs in un-America. This is not new. This is why we can never say that Trump is not is acting un-American. He is acting very much like parts of our American history, not the only part, but we cannot act as though what we're seeing in him and others is, and is an alien to this society. It is in fact a part of the trickery that has been in the society and the reason why there has always needed to be people who will stay with the truth. We see it on full display when a black man, an attorney general from Kentucky, profusely praises Trump at the Republican convention and then distorts the truth about the purpose of grand juries and whether or not police should have been indicted. All of this happens On the same day, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was being laid in state on the Capitol, on the steps of the Supreme Court. It's all trickery. It's trickery. And we must call it what it is. But that's also why, fourthly, we must be tenacious in pushing the platform and principles of the Poor People's Campaign, a national call for moral revival. We must be tenacious in showing it doesn't have to be this way. We can't just curse the the darkness. We can't just cry out that the democracy is dying without saying life is possible. It doesn't have to be this way. We must be tenacious and not giving up. We must be tenacious in recognizing that the world needs your, the world needs our moral prophetic voices, our bodies, our votes, our vision right now. This is not just partisan political work. This is our time. It is our time. Some years ago, when I was dealing with the period of my own personal depression, I wrote a poem. I thought it was for back then, but now more and more as these days are happening, I realize it was for right now. It speaks to how we must be tenacious in holding on to our dreams and visions of the better. We can never be so, so, um, so depressed by what's happening around us, that we stop fighting for a better future. The poem I wrote is entitled, What is Life? And it raises this question, what is life? Is it to be lived or dreamed about perhaps both? Maybe our dreaming determines our living to some degree. And yet so much tries to kill our dreams, snatch our dreams, take away our dreams, defer our dreams, and keep our dreams from reality. Maybe then, We must fight for and pray for and ask God to grant us the gift of dreaming afresh and anew, dreaming God's dreams, dreaming, hoping, and delighting in the things of God freshly poured out upon our hearts and minds like the morning dew. How we need it so. Then perhaps if we dream right, we will live right, and then we shall know the answer to the inquirer's question. What is life? Is it to be lived or dreamed about or both? The spirit brings the gift of dreaming into the now. What God has hoped becomes, even if at first just in our thoughts, a new reality. We began to see and dream in the now what God has always wanted since the beginning. God's dreams become our desire when the spirit is at work. Men and women may never understand, but this is what happened deep in the soul of Sojourner and Frederick and Lucretia and Mother Jones, and Mary, and Martin, and Mega, and Malcolm, and Harriet, and Fannie Lou, and Rosa, and Cesar Chavez, and, De- and Desmond, and Mandela. This is what happened even at their darkest moments. What moved them, and so many others, 
God's dream. By the Spirit, come take a look at God's dreams that we must see even in the midst of nightmare situation. God's dreams, the cow laying down with the bear, children playing over the hole of a snake, lion and lamb frolicking together. God's dreams, humanity redeemed, grace imparted, pain pushed away, tears wiped, death vanquished, the hunger fed, the hurting healed, racism eradicated, justice ruling, poverty no more, righteous prevailing, deliverance completed, Satan snared, God's dreams, what a wonder, what a look. Our lives are transformed in the midst of tribulation when we dream God's dreams. No longer mere mundane movement, no more settling for superficial answers, away with despair and depression and a life without purpose. We can rise captivated and controlled by God's dreams. And so it seems our dreams determine our living, and we live because of our dreams. O oh, Spirit of the living God, invade, invade, invade once again the nightmarish corners of our minds. Loose the prophetic flow into the depths of our being with God's dreams so that we might live anew and afresh. We must in this moment be tenacious about holding on and seeing God's dreams of justice and love and mercy. That we must stay together. We must keep moving nonviolently forward together. The great danger in this hour is to retreat to our silos. You see, the oppressors always want to hit us so hard that we will, it will divide us and conquer us. And so they want black people to go in their own corner because of the killings we've seen. And then they want uh, uh, environmentalists in their own corner. And they want workers in their own corner. And they want to keep us divided while about those who are engaged in oppression, if you ever notice, they always stay unified. Just together because that's where we have our political power. That's where we have our moral power. That's where we have our spiritual power. That's why we are together, regardless of race, even color, technology. That's why in the Pulaski campaign, we don't separate issues out and talk about them in one, this in the black room and this in the native room and this in the Latino room and this in the gay room and this in the straight room and this in the Western room and this in the Eastern room and this in the Southern room and this in the Northern room. No, we must stay together. We must stay together. If our togetherness wasn't powerful, they wouldn't work so hard to divide us. We now know if we just stay together, that poor and low wealth people control a third of the electorate in this country if we stay together. We can change the South from Maryland all the way over to New Mexico, not 50 years from now. It can begin this year. We can, we can do mighty things together. And it's not even all of us that remnant can stay together. We found out a few weeks ago that in just 15 states, if 20% of poor and low wealth people that didn't vote, voted this time. In some states, it's less than one, it's less than 2%. Together, together we can change the outcome of every political race from the governor all the way to the president. Together, together, together. We've got to stay together. And not only must we stay together physically, we must stay together spiritually. We cannot allow this moment, as hard as it is, and I know it's hard. I know it's hard. I've had to bury people in this moment as a pastor. I know it's hard. I know with my own immune deficiencies how troubling these moments have been. I know it's hard. Hard when we can't do some things we want to do. Hard to watch things on TV. Hard to see the doubt, downright corruptness of those who are, in, are not infected with coronavirus, but are infected with the virus of greed and racism and the lust for power. I know it's hard, but we have to stay together. And we have to speak to each other when we see each other falling apart. And so I close here. It was at a crowded public meeting in Fanuel Hall, where Frederick Douglass was one of the chief speakers. Douglass had been describing the wrongs, the wrongs toward the black race. And as he proceeded, he grew more and more excited. And finally, he ended by saying that they had no hope of justice from the whites. Frederick got really depressed in that speech. He said there was no possible hope, Liz, except in their own, their own right 
to take arms. He, he lost it in that speech. It had beat him down. All the years of calling for right and seeing more wrong had beat him down. Sojourner Truth was there. She was sitting tall and dark and on the very first front seat. She was facing the platform. And there was a deep hush over the room. Nobody had seen Douglas this depressed before. He was her friend. He, she knew, though, he, this lion of a man, in, in that moment, the structures and the powers of evil had gotten to him. And he, people of Spain had nothing left to tell them of the hope. And when Douglas sat down, they say so just look at him in the quietness of the room while everybody was trying to figure out if Douglas has lost hope, what can the rest of us do? And there in that voice that only Sojourner Truth had, the voice that said, ain't I a woman? She said it, that it was heard all over the house. Frederick, is God dead? And it is said that those words caused Frederick to get it together in his spirit, caused the movement to get it together, caused people to understand that they were not alone. And even in the midst of all of that tribulation and trial, they were instruments being used by God to change the course of history. I declare unto you today, God is not dead. The spirit of justice is not dead. The spirit of love is not dead. And so let us be the ones that take on the politics of death and bring life, not in our own strength alone, but in the strength of that which is life itself. God bless you. Love you. Look at the bottom of the screen. You can see all the ways to hook up. Everything that is being done now let it cause the greatest turnout of democracy and the vote that has ever been seen in this country. We are not weak. We may be facing tribulation, but we are also in the midst of transformation. And we must be tenacious. We must hold on to the truth and we must stay together. God bless you. Amen.